Uh, it's great to be back with you. I'm Senator Kolbeck. Not only thank you to all the speakers who traveled so far, but thank you to each and every one of you. I know for a fact we got some folks from northern Michigan who joined us here today. That's a bit of a hike, and uh, I just want to say thank you for coming out. And uh, let's get this on the right speaker, shall we? Oops. So are we? Uh... All righty. We're going to talk about a couple other risks, but before we do that, I want to pick up where Dr. Zybron left off about some clinical observations. My wife is an MD. She's a pediatrician. Uh, we went to every specialist in the book to try to identify what was the issue with her tinnitus, and she also had thyroid issues as well. Um, it wasn't until Mr. Bathgate came over to our home and actually went off and started monitoring what was going on inside our home that we started looking into Wi-Fi and smart meters, and we turned them off. And, uh, and believe me, I wasn't happy about this. Just so you know, I was in that denial stage because I didn't want to rewire my whole home. Uh, but guess what happened afterward? Tinnitus after two weeks disappeared. And I'll relay another anecdotal story. But it's uh, my, I, um, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, for that matter, have serious AFib issues on a regular basis. Turns out that they had two smart meters sitting outside their kitchen where they spend most of their time. Uh, we opted them out of the smart meter, moved the uh, Wi-Fi down in the basement, and uh, now, uh, instead of having a pacemaker installed, everything is hunky-dory, and these guys both look like spring chickens at the age of 75 and 80. So these are anecdotal stories, but they're, for me, they wake me up to the fact that these adverse health impacts that we just went over with all these experts, and by the way, another round of applause for all these experts. For <laughs> We gave him the challenge of trying to summarize a life's worth of work in 10 minutes. So I just want to highlight that that was not an easy task. So we had to distill some of the baser elements of what we were talking about, and I think they did a great job. I'm going to delve into something beyond the adverse health impact. So I want to talk about a couple other risks that are pertinent to my duties as a legislator here, or here we are at the state capitol out in Lansing. And I want to talk about something that points us back to this little thing called the Constitution. And so there's a couple other risks that I'm going to delve into. And the first one I want to talk about is personal data privacy. And uh, we have this little thing in our Constitution called the Fourth Amendment, where we're supposed to be secure in our persons. And that, t that includes our, our personal effects inside our home. Um, and uh, a lot of this includes this data that is gathered um, by smart meters in particular. Um, and I, I just want to make sure everybody understands, this is what the Fourth Amendment says, is that we are supposed to have the right to be secure in our persons against unreasonable searches and seizures. All right? So we have an appreciation for privacy. As a legislator, I am duty-bound to make sure that I respect this provision in our Constitution. I took an oath to support it. So as we look forward, let's see what's actually going on today. Um, we got personal data collection happening with smart meters. Essentially, the way I like to break this out is that the smart meters handle all the information gathering inside your home. 5G systems, once fully deployed, will handle the data gathering outside the home. So pretty much your whole life is the Truman Show. <laughs> and uh, being on a statewide campaign as I was recently, I get a full appreciation for that because I had somebody filming every step I took <laughs> out there. So what, what is the data that's actually being collected? And I know Bill probably addressed a little bit of this while I was out. but. Um, Essentially what they're building is a nice little consumer profile for you. They have data on the make and model of every electronic device that you have inside your home. They know when you turn it on, when you turn it off. This is the stuff you kill for from a marketing perspective. I used to work in marketing for one of the major OEMs, and we were at the early stage of something called permission-based marketing. And that's what this is. This is providing a full-up profile on you as a consumer. And there's a lot of information you can get, gain around this data. Now, when you go off and extend this out into the world of 5G, which is outside the home, now there's a gold mine. You know what kind of car you're driving. You know when you go, where you go to different places. I mean, a lot of the stuff we already have with a smartphone. If you want something really creepy, you can go back in time and find out exactly where you were in 2008 for on vacation and which restaurant you ate at. It starts getting a little bit um, overwhelming. Now, we all willingly just go off and click that I accept every time we sign up for any of this stuff, right? But I want to make sure we all understand what we're actually signing off on when we do that. And some of this data, we may not be that comfortable going off and sharing. 
And so I want to make sure we have an appreciation. This personal data collection is happening. It's in smart meters. They're using it to gather it inside our, that data inside our home with 5G deployments and already to a certain extent with 3G and 4G, you're gathering it outside the home. So where is this going uh, from a policy perspective? Well, there was a recent ruling by the Seventh Circuit Court regarding smart meter data and the collection of smart meter data. It was in a court case for a Naperville smart meter awareness group versus the city of Naperville. And the Seventh Circuit Court ruled a couple things. Um, first of all, the good news. They said that the data collected by smart meters is subject to Fourth Amendment protections. All right, that's good. Makes sense, right? The bad news is um, now we get into the clause of uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. They held that it was reasonable for, this, for these utilities to collect that data on behalf of our society so that they could better determine how to better allocate energy and better control the distribution of energy. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't know what your background is on the Fourth Amendment, but the Fourth Amendment was specifically put in place to protect individual rights. This court decision actually extended it so that now we are looking at collective rights. It's not the way our system of government was set up. And so I want to highlight that they went on to say in this decision that if they were to use this data in a court of law, they probably would have ruled differently. Um, and so, but the data's out there. So uh, I, um, I have a little bit of a concern here. Now, if you talk to any of our utilities here in the state, they'll say that that data's secure. Um, it's not going to be shared with anybody else. It's out there. But uh, I would also submit that you know, there's a good case to be made that that data shouldn't even be collected in the first place. And so I want to make sure this is, this is the latest court decision that I've seen on this. This is actually a pretty recent ruling. All right, so where does this all go? How many of you guys have heard of something called a social credit system? All right, I want to clear, make it clear to everybody. Um, we're not in China. We're not in Russia. <laughs> We're in the United States of America. We value this little thing called freedom, and we have things like the Fourth Amendment to protect those freedoms, right? Other governments don't have that Fourth Amendment. They have a much different approach to governing their people. In China, it's very much a totalitarian society. So a lot of people will talk about 5G and say, hey, man, we're in a race for 5G. We've got to beat the Chinese. We've got to beat the Russians on the deployment of 5G. How many of you guys have heard that? Well, how many of you guys run a race without understanding where the finish line is? <laughs> All right. The finish line on this is pretty clear. This 5G system, how many of you guys have read George Orwell's 1984? This, is, this blows away what George Orwell had envisioned. Uh, um, what we're, what we're doing here is they collect all kinds of data on your behavior as you go through the day, the types of products you purchase, the type of things you say about the government, um, and you get bumped up based on being a good, trustworthy citizen and uh, a, 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 adhering to what the party is telling you. In this case, it's the Chinese Communist Party, which, by the way, plans to fully deploy this and by 2020. So that's not like 2030 or 2040. This is 2020. They've already got it deployed in, in elements of society. Um, and what they do is everything in, in China is a cashless society, pretty much. You have to use your smartphone. You have to use some sort of technology to conduct a transaction. So what they will do, if you don't have a good credit score, you can't buy plane tickets. You can't buy high-speed rail tickets. Um, this is just a start. Yeah, <laughs> you can't get into college. Well, some colleges, I don't know, but, the, uh, but uh, yeah. So they use the state to control your access to things that we take for granted as citizens. This is where we are headed down that personal data collection path. And I can tell you, as somebody who's run a lot of political campaigns, there's a lot of data we have on, on voters, a heck of a lot of data. Um, and, uh, and these profiles are real. People in government will use this information increasingly to go off and make sure that you are trustworthy citizens. And I, I, um, I wish that this was uh, something that I, I didn't have to worry about, but um, Unfortunately, it, it is something that we need to be concerned with. That Fourth Amendment was put in for a reason. We need to respect it. Um, so I'm going to move on to another risk. Now, see all the connectedness that has to go on to make this happen? So we're having technology all over the place, on it, right? All these require servers. I mean, this is, you got, uh, Bill provided some of his uh, tawdry wares here to go off and talk about some of the technology. This is just the tip of the iceberg as far as what's needed 
there's servers that keep everything humming and, and communicating between one device to another device, all this kind of stuff. So I want to talk about something that is another serious risk. We talked about adverse health impacts, adverse health risks. We talked about personal data security. Now I want to talk about national security. And this is something very serious as well, because the purpose of government is to secure the rights of the governed. Well, you can't be secure in those rights if you're not protecting the citizens. How many of you guys have heard about the Chinese motherboard hack? Uh, for those of you who don't know, about 85% of our motherboards are actually manufactured over in China. And the Chinese government has made a habit out of going into the uh, specs for those motherboards and making sure that they have a, a little backdoor chip installed that's about the size of a little pencil tip here. It cycles through at the end. And it's installed on 85% of our motherboards. These motherboards find their way into things like Aegis missile system uh, computers. They find their way into SCADAs, which are controlling our electrical grid. They find their way into uh, everyday life. I, you know, the the uh, items uh, uh, or the uh, computers controlling our, our uh, in some communities, controlling our stoplights. Um, this is pretty pervasive. So it, essentially, it's tying into every facet of our life. How many of you guys saw the movie Live Free or Die Hard? Now, usually I'm not a big guy saying, oh, it's, it's just in a movie, that's not real, that's never going to happen here. Well, guess what? That's exactly what we're enabling with an increasing dependence on this connectivity. You know, I was just at a, the retirement ceremony for Adjutant General Greg Vadney, and I found it quite telling at the end of his uh, retirement ceremony that he, had, he was holding up to everybody that was present, and there was a lot of military officers there, um, and a lot of non-coms out there as well, but a lot of people responsible for our national security. And you know what he said to everybody? He held up a map and he held up a compass and he says, you guys better not forget the basics. You need to understand how to find your, your way around because some of the technology we're depending upon may not be there when war breaks out. This is our lead war maker, war fighter here in the state of Michigan giving us a warning on that. I want everybody to understand this is not just about um, uh, personal uh, adverse health impacts. It is not just about personal data security. It's also about national security. As we increase our dependency in these network of things, um, these are all good stuff. They can all be fun to do. It's all convenient. But there is a risk that goes along with each and every one of these, and we need to go in with our eyes wide open. So another thing we need to go into with our eyes wide open is a break. How many of you guys are ready for a break? <laughs> All right, we're going to have a 15-minute break. If you guys can get settled here within 10